hi to you know to Sergey Baranov um, on behalf of the you know the, the Thank You Plant Medicine Leadership Group. My name is uh, Joe Vaughan, um, and I thought it'd be you know really interesting to spend some time uh, to to talk to one of you know the the world's leading experts on the uh, on on the sacred medicine of Wachuma. So um, Sergey, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you, Joe. I, I'm not sure about the leading expert, but I definitely have some experience, so we can talk about it. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, you know, there's this, it's such a, you know, a huge, uh, you know, topic, you know, to talk about, you know, plant medicine in its entirety. Um, I guess in this in this conversation, we'll talk predominantly about Wachuma. I've got some personal experiences, which I would, I would like to, to share and, and, and get your expert opinion on. Um, but I just wonder if you if you'd maybe want to just tell tell us a little bit about you know kind of you know I know it's a very very long story having read having read your book it's a very long story it's an epic <laughs> an epic tale but if you just maybe tell us a little bit about how you kind of came to to working to work with Wachuma and how you came to set up your 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 center in, uh, in the Sacred Valley in Peru. Um, well, I was a spiritual seeker, you know, and I was um, searching for direct experience pretty much all my life but it was not accessible at the time where I was living so at the time my path was reading and taking psychedelic food so that's how I came to plant medicine later to whatever I, it became possible when I moved to United States and from there I started to go to Peru and Mexico and work with uh, shamans there So it's a really long story. I mean, if the question why I came to plant medicine, then we can talk about that too. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's generally. I mean, uh, there's there's various entry points. I mean, I, I I have my own entry point into into using plant medicine, having grown up in a in a you know I guess in the sort of late eighties, early nineties um, in the UK, where there's a, a very big you know rave scene and. And so there was a lot of, you know, interest in, 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 you know, psychoactive, you know, you know, substances at that particular time, um, but not, not taken in a conscious way. Um, it tended to be in a more kind of you know, hedonistic, you know, kind of un unconscious way. So, you know, my, my entry point really? into plant med medicine a bit later on was, 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 you know, from a different perspective. So just interested, interested to hear how, how you came to the, you know, and, and then and then Wachuma in particular, because you know there are there are multiple, you know, you know, plant medicines. Are, you know, you know, there's you know the psilocybin mushrooms. There are there's you know sort of DMT containing compounds, ayahuasca, and so forth. Um, but I'm interested in how how it came to be that you know Wachuma um, in the mescaline containing compounds came to be your you know your area of, of expertise. Well, I was doing the same. Uh, thing you did probably at the same time it was I think it was 90s yeah like late late 90s something like that this is that was a time of rape party and ecstasy pills and acid and, and all that that was in Israel when I was living there and that was fun I, I enjoyed it very much and you know you kind of you know you feel freedom there and somewhere in the forest it's good to, it's, it's good time you know you're just having a good time but mm -hmm. At some point, I just felt like I'm not really satisfied from that. You know, it's not fulfilling. It's enjoyable. It's good. It's like you know, it's a break away from a boredom and the routine and work and all that stuff. But it wasn't really spiritually satisfying. My spiritual thirst was strong and needed more substance. You know, like spiritual substance, not substances I was taking. You know, mm. that was part of it. Uh, and this is when. At the same time, pretty much, I had a friend who introduced me to works of Carlos Castaneda and then Gurdjieff at the same time, pretty much within the same year or so. And that really opened me up, you know, especially when, when I read Castaneda, I felt the magic in it. I felt that, whoa, peyote, whoa, Mexican shamans, what is it, you know? This sounds very real. So I felt like totally torn on by Castaneda and then Gurdjieff came and then in between because they are very different but you know if you, if you look into 
Gurdjieff work and Castaneda, you, you know, it's different, but they all bring you to that place of magic, you know, in, in, from different ways. Yeah. So, combining reading with MDMA, that was my favorite drug, you know. I wasn't a fan of acid very much. I did it, but I didn't find it to be suitable with me, you know. I, for me, it was too cold. Uh, I want something warmer. So MDMA was the drug of my choice, and I started to move away from the rave culture and all that thing. I still like the music and like the people, but I decided to spend my time more in contemplation, more trying to understand things, you know. So I was taking by myself, you know, outside in nature and reading and thinking. And then I joined the fourth way group. I want to go deeper into the work, and the teacher was living in California, so I moved to America, basically, for that, following the teacher. And then, you know, if you read the book, you know what happened there, you know, I ended up in the cold, and we kind of skipped the six years of that madness. But during the time, I, I continued with psychedelics, that what kept me sane in the cold, you know. I found, it was beautiful, Northern California, the forest, pine forest, beautiful, beautiful. So... I had my time with myself, you know, away from all that brainwashing and indoctrination. And that kind of kept me going and in my search and more reading and going deeper into it. And then it was very interesting uh, how I came to plants. It was um, a Shulgin site, Alexander Shulgin site, you know. It, uh, I think it was like, ask Shulgin a question. And everybody knows who Alexander Shulgin is, the father of all chemical psychedelics that, uh, you know, you have today. And what I found interesting is that on his website, right on the banner, it says, <coughs> look for shamans, they are scattered all over the world. And I thought, like, hmm, interesting, the guy that's a biochemist, totally, you know, a PhD in biochemical um, science, and he's referring to shamans. He, he's telling you, go look for shamans, you know, and the guy who is producing all the psychedelics. So I found it very interesting. I was like, hmm, interesting. Why is he doing that? that well, why he's not saying this? When I actually started ex looking, you know? something I w always wanted to do, I w it, it was in my head, but I didn't really make any effort, you know. So after this, I really started searching, you know, using internet. And this is how I found people in Peru. That's how I, how I ended up with Howard, where mm -hmm. you went, you know? And that was the connection, and basically, it started from there. Interesting. I mean, I, I also read, um, you know, some of the Carlos Castaneda work, um, and I've got to be honest, some of it was, was properly terrifying, um, because some, some of the, you know, the, the events in those, in those, in those mm -hmm. books would would probably be quite frightening to the kind of, you know, the, the ordinary person, you know, with, a, with an ordinary life, you know, because that was a, certainly a, a non-ordinary, uh, you know, situation that, that he found himself in. So, I mean, I'm interested in, in how that, you know, how you make a transition from, a, I guess, a, a normal, in inverted commas, um, existence into a, into a world which, which to, to kind of ordinary people might seem sort of fantastical and difficult. So, and one of the, one of the things about, uh, thank you plant medicine is, is, is around trying to sort of destigmatize, demystify and normalize again, in inverted commas, the, you know, the, the transition and the, and the pathway from, you know, a normal nine to five, you know, existence into working with with plant medicine sacred modalities which have been in existence for for a very very long time so you know how, how would you i guess how would you you know not convince is maybe the wrong word but how would you how would you say to someone who is maybe frightened of of the experience and maybe frightened of maybe they've read a cast in the book and thought i don't i don't want anything as scary as that you know how, how would you how would you kind of you know not sell it, so again, the wrong word, but how would you, you know, introduce it to, to the kind of ordinary person? Well, to talk about Castaneda, I think it's important, you know, not everything you read is true. I mean, it's, at least not from my experience. The guy was a brilliant writer. He's a really good writer. He's an interesting guy. He's like, he takes you into the story. 
But when you do medicine, and, and I happened to go in Mexico and do medicine with Richard Shaman, uh, so basically I was there uh, doing what he was to talking about, and things were different. It's not what you read in the book, you know, in his books. His books are really fantastic, you know. Mm. But but Peyotis, it's not what he says it is, and Mexican shamans are not what he says they are, you know. There's a big difference between his books and the reality. So in reality, there was nothing really scary. It was very grounding, down to earth. I mean, literally, I'm sitting on the earth drinking medicine by the fire, you know. So nothing of what you read really was there. So there is no nothing scary there, you know. Mm. Also, uh, I would suggest reading less trip reports, you know, because that can be a block on your discovery, you know, that the, the less you read, the better, unless you read books by someone who actually doing medicine. So in my books, I'm trying to share with people as it actually happens. So if you read it, there's nothing scary there. So how many, how many books have, have you written now? Well, I'm working on the third one right now, which okay. is also dedicated to Wachuma. And the second was, Second book was also the end of Wachuma, but I call it Masculine Confession because I really came from uh, from a little bit scientific perspective. You know, I want to bring the research into it to show people what was known about masculine in the first half of 20th century and who was involved and what happened and the prohibition. And now the third book would be more a bit, a bit more personal, more warm, maybe less science, more emotional. You know. Um, I have a, you know, just to kind of go go into the kind of masculine discussion a little bit. Uh, maybe you know, for people who are who may be listening or watching who who don't know much about the different types of psychoactive compounds. So mescaline, um, from what little I, you know, I'd, I'd read about it before I, I'd had experience, and we'll come on to talk about that, I guess, in a minute. But the, what I'd um, what I'd, I guess it was Aldous Huxley who who made maybe yes. mescaline, uh, a, a, you know, a kind of compound which people kind of understood and knew about. So maybe if you, you know, maybe explain a little bit about the difference between maybe mescaline and maybe DMT or psilocybin and some of the other other plants that, that people would be using. Well, definitely Huxley, he brought it into the mainstream. That's how people knew about mescaline. And The Doors of Perception, that was the book that created a lot of uh, fire, you know, uh, and you know, many people were upset. People on the spiritual side, on the religious side, they were pretty much upset. If you research deeply, uh, there was a lot of uh, criticism, like, be because the Huxley, he was a brilliant guy, you know, so when he took masculine, he tapped into the mysticism, he tapped into the mystical side of it right away. And that was not done in a ceremonial setting, that was done like they used extracted masculine in the apartment in the Beverly Hills somewhere, you know? So it, it's like removed layers removed from what we're doing, you know, and yet he saw the whole mystical dimension of this, you know, which tells you who he was and tells you what mescaline does, you know. Every psychedelic different, you know, psilocybin, ayahuasca, uh, wachuma, well, peyote and wachuma, they're very similar, they're from the same family and I see them brothers, so maybe cousins, but the DMT is very different, real, man, psilocybin different, so that's one important thing. For people who just getting into psychedelic and plant medicine, that's very important to understand that they're all different. It's a different world, completely different world. You can call them all psychedelic, but it's very general. Psychedelic means simply mind manifesting, and they all do, you know, but they all do it in different ways. So DMT is one thing, it takes you to a completely different realm. It's a short lived experience, very intense can be very scary too, you know, for someone who not familiar with that kind of experience, can be frightening. Um, masculine, it's a different journey, it's, it's a journey within yourself, you know, and I don't really like to talk about masculine, I like to talk about the complete plant, I mean, I just, you know, it's important to consume the whole plant, I'm against extraction. Personally, I don't want extraction. We use, we work with spirits of the plants. Mm. You the whole plant. If you want DMT type experience, I suggest you drink ayahuasca because there is a spirit there. 
there's a teacher there. When you extract DMT, well, it's not the same anymore, you know. Same with masculine, same with psilocybin. I mean, if you want to have a psilocybin experience, eat mushrooms. Don't take psilocybin extracted from the lab. That's just my personal advice to do it. That's how you get closer to the earth. You get closer to the intelligence, you know. Mm. And with masculine, that's why I don't really like to talk about so the difference. alcohol. Okay, the what you experience. Part, let's talk about, about what you might experience uh, versus uh, other experiences. What Chuma is not really taking you, you know, it brings you in. Like when you drink ayahuasca, you're really more like taken by her, you know, to a, a certain dimension. It's her dimension. It's a spiritual dimension with spirits and plants and and other beings, you know. With Wachuma, you don't experience this. With Wachuma, you, you connect to the great spirit, you know, you connect to the whole, you connect to nature. So you are present in this world. But the world changes, you know. You, you start seeing the magic of nature that is there always, but we just disconnected from this in a normal state of consciousness. So you are very conscious of yourself. You're very present. You're very adequate. But you feel something you couldn't feel before. So Huachuma, the magic of Huachuma, it's really in feeling. It's mm. not such as visual, though the visual, the beauty is very much there. But the feeling is what it's where it is, you know. Yeah. And there is nothing scary about that. Unless you're afraid of love, you have nothing to be afraid because there will be a lot of love. For Chuma, is pure love. And if you never experience love, then you'll be overwhelmed for sure. Yeah, but that's I, a, lot, a lot of people talk about a, a certain calling when it comes to to working with with sacred plant medicines and of of different types. And I, and I was called in a very kind of, you know, subtle uh, way to, to a place in Peru where, where you and I ha, have, have both been, um, which was run by the sadly departed, uh, you know, Don Howard Lawler, um, who may be familiar to, to some people. Um, I had a, a, a certain calling to, to, to go to visit uh, Don Howard's place um, and, and to work with Wachuma. I had certain other options on the table, you know, maybe another uh, experience with ayahuasca or maybe something, you know, something you know, with, with psilocybin or whatever. But I had a a very strong calling to 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 work to go to Peru and 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 sit with Don Howard. Um, and as it turned out, very sadly, it was it was one of his last ever uh, Wachuma, um, you know, mesas, as as I guess the the or masada, um, I think he called it. Um, and so, yeah, I was I was very very fortunate to to have to have that experience. And this is this leads me on to I guess more of a you know sort of question for you, having worked you know extensively, I believe best part of a thousand ceremonies uh, with 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 Wachuma. Um, in that the first uh, you know you're familiar with the, the the way that that Howard would have run his his retreats. Cool. Um, you would you would have the ceremony. You would then go on a on some kind of excursion. Uh, into the Amazon to meet with um, indigenous tribes or you know, local communities or, or go to very beautiful places. Um, and it was very much like in a daytime and, and as you say, a, a kind of heart opening and, and warming experience. But for me, the, the first uh, the first two ceremony, no, the f yeah, the first two ceremonies I had um, with with Howard, I, I, I actually felt quite bummed out in a, in a way um and you know the 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 dosage of medicine i'd had you know didn't seem to kind of break through um i was you know the, the group of people who were in the ceremony at the same time there was a lot of people in the group um and you know i started to kind of have you know some negative kind of feelings towards them and i felt like maybe you know, some of the experiences I'd had with the indigenous tribes were contradictory, and I, I, I just was kind of in a bit of a, a, a fog of being bummed out. Um, so I, so I approached, and this happened for the first two ceremonies, um, and so for the third one, I, I asked Howard if I could maybe increase the level of the, the dose level, um, and he was well, you know, a bit surprised, and he said, well, I don't know why you'd want to do that. You know, it's very powerful. Are you sure, etc. And I said, well. There was someone else in the group who'd, who'd had another, who'd had a double dose um, in, the, in the second ceremony. So I thought, well, you know, if he can do it, then maybe I should. He said, well, he's, you know, six foot five and 
240 pounds you know I'm, yeah. I'm 511 <laughs> you know I'm 511 and maybe 200 pounds I said but I said he said okay if you want to if you want to you can and I said okay so I did um and so we were just I did the two the two the two the two cups and and then I went to sit on the boat you'll be familiar with the dock uh, at the, at the yeah. retreat center yeah. sitting on the sit, just about to get on the boat to go on another excursion and then you know, I think a lot in your in your work, you talk about the experience, you know, the lived experience of of the of the medicine and whatnot, and the and the opening that you can receive, you know, in, in real experience in real time. And as I was sitting on the boat, just about to go up up the river, I had this sense of 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 a, of a visitation, if you like, in my kind of my mind's eye. It wasn't a, a hallucination. It wasn't like I was sitting in front of another you know, being or an alternative in a, an alternative universe. I just had this vision in my mind's eye of this kind of, you know, very kindly spirit um, saying to me, you know, welcome. You, you were lost to us. You know, welcome, brother. You were lost to us. You know, and, and, and showed me what absolute acceptance looked like in the real experience. And that was so contrasting to the judgment that I'd been feeling and the bummed out fog that I'd been in. And it was just seeing those two things, like, you know, just laid out side by side. It was just so overwhelming. And I broke down. I had my sunglasses on, but I just broke down in tears, you know, on the boat. You know, I wasn't sitting in sort of, you know, some, you know, lotus position. It just came at a really, <laughs> I think what seemed to be quite an odd moment. But probably, one, you know, one of the most profound experiences I've ever had on any plant medicine ever. So... I don't know if you've got any comments on that or, or, or kind of observations about how that, how that maybe manifested itself or... I see it often, you know, people come and, you know, what you want is, is breaking through your ego, really. Breaking through judgment, breaking through the personality layer, you know. So what you described, it was that. You just came and you maybe accept, uh, and you expected things to be a bit different and maybe you wanted them to be different, but then things, what they are. So it's just a matter of accepting, but accepting, as you said, is experience. It's not a word. That's the problem. Many teachers will tell you, oh, you know, just accept things. I mean, <laughs> you can't just accept. If that would be so easy, then everybody would be in acceptance, living in acceptance. Nobody would be judging other people. Nobody would be, you know, it's experience. It's exactly what, what Chuma taught you. It was very important. That's something you can use in life. Same experience you can use right now, like tomorrow you go to work or, and you have like difficulties, you just bring it, that memory and it will help you to adjust to the situation and to deal with it, you know, it's like, so I see this happen, so you might just break through this, but in a gentle way, it doesn't really break through, it's kind of moving you through this and kind of bringing the best out of you. Bring your essence out, and in essence, we're all good, you know. It's the personality that has, you know, friction with others. But in essence, we are all people, and we all want the same thing, and we're all good in heart. So to get to that point, you need medicine to break to that ice, you know. So what you describe, it's very, it's very much sounds like that. That what you might just reach down to your essence, to your best self. To your real self, to your true self, not the guy in the in the head who doesn't like this guy or doesn't agree with this, uh, you know, tribe. Or it's like oh, compare thing, you know, or kind of. It reached down to the best self that was in the moment. Mm. That's it. In the moment, that was the situation. Whether you like or not, I mean, that's where you are. So you can fight it, or you can accept it and enjoy it. You know. So I think it was that was what Chuma did. Just showed you what what acceptance feels like. And that's, that connects to what I said before, what you is feeling, you know, the magic of what you is feeling makes you feel things. And when you feel things, you know them. It has the power to change you, like what you just described. And suddenly your day was different, your moment transformed. And everybody was now good and beautiful and, and you were crying there, sitting like, man, this is the most beautiful experience of my life. But a minute ago, you were hating guys there. Mm. This guy was too noisy. This guy was, yeah. Nothing. I'm interested in, in what sort of size of groups that you think are kind of is, is an optimal level 
like, you know, to get a kind of a, a personalised slash, you know, supportive environment and good experience? Well, I personally prefer smaller groups, you know, because this is when I can get personal with people. Because, you know, it takes time. You have to talk to every person. And, you know, there's so much hours in a day. And, you know, it takes two hours for the medicine to unfold. And then we walk home. So we have, like, maybe six hours together. So if I have six people, that's very private. That's very intimate. You know, I can talk to everybody. I can feel into it. Uh, optimal, like, it's hard to say. Eight, ten people is good. But that's about as probably big. That that's about as much as I would like to have, because then it's getting and depends also what kind of people. If people already have experience before with psychedelics or other plants, so they need less time, they need less attention. You only identify people who need energy, so you can give more to somebody who need. But it depends on the group. If if it's like you have ten people who never had medicine before, and you know a few of them need help at the same time, and uh, you know it becomes a bit uh, challenging. So. The lesser, the better. It depends on the group, but I would, I would, I would keep it around ten. Yeah, just kind of my feeling. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the experience I had on Wachuma was quite an interesting one. And in the, the, there's a, a guy who'd be very active in, in uh, you know, in the promotion of of Howard Lawler's work and Spirit Quest and so on. A guy probably people know him, um, Aubrey Marcus. Um, he, he, he and his group were were, were there um, at the time that I was there. So there was a very very large group of, you know, quite big big personalities, including you know kind of, you know, U UFC fighters and, and and things like that. So I think I don't know if you remember on the uh, at, at Spirit Quest, but they have this sort of star deck. There's the, yeah. the, 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 the stars. Yeah, he built Chav it later. Yeah, there's like a Chavin sort of artifact up there. So I was up there trying to prepare for ceremony and trying to you know get deep and all that and you know <laughs> uh, pro pro probably taking it probably taking it too seriously um you know that's what that's where i was at the time in terms of my own headspace i was probably in need of of the medicine <laughs> in, in, a lot at that point um but i was sitting up there trying to get deep and trying to commune with nature and looking out over the over the river and it was a, it was a beautiful moment and all i heard was this kind of stomping up <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was like, it was a kind of you know massive you know UFC fight. I'd come running up using it as a kind of a, a hill a hill sprint, um, you know, as as preparation for a ceremony. And everyone prepares for ceremony in their own way, but you know, mine was very much you know trying to you know become a monk and sort of contemplate. Whereas there was a a kind of a you know a desire to work out. I mean, they all looked amazing. I've got to give them that. You know, you know, I was kind of. You know, holding my stomach in as I was walking around, and trying, you know, but you know, they're a very, very fit group of people. But you know, being involved with that kind of group of people, um, that that size of a group of people with that energy and and stuff like that, I found I found a challenge. Um, you know, but you know, so I, I I definitely resonate with your point about you know smaller and more well, intimate groups. Bigger, and, bigger yeah. group, it's just harder to focus on the medicine, you know. Mm. There's more distractions, so yeah. unless it's already people who know the medicine, who kind of more disciplined, but you never yeah. know. And, and, so, I mean, in, in fairness to you know to Aubrey Marcus and his and his and his group, I mean they they they'd, they'd worked they'd been there maybe three, four, five times. They they've made documentaries about the place. I mean they've been you know hugely vocal uh, in their in their and dedicated. Yeah, so I mean, you know, props to them for their for their efforts to, to bring awareness. Um, but but yeah, still a lot of people still different. Yeah, even, even the best people you can have, but if you have 25, 30 people, it's just harder to hold the space, you know, and, and it becomes dispersed. The end, of the focus become dispersed, you know. It's it's harder to to keep it that way, you know. It just become more like chaotic and. It's just not the same, you know. The connection with the medicine harder to establish. Yeah, that, that, that's how I felt. I felt I was slightly on a, a, you know, a bit of a kind of reality TV show in the in the jungle. You know, that's how that's how it felt a little bit. You know, but I mean, that's by the by. You know, no no hard feelings to anyone. But yeah, I mean, it's really great hearing those uplifting stories about you know about people's transformations. You know, people on the brink of you know almost you know 
of, of dying and then coming and you know and, and having their hope kind of resurrected so it's great you know to have to have those you know maybe a good place to end on what you know those uplifting stories and and you know say thank you to you for your you know your efforts and your your time and, and great to hear your story about your sort of shamanic uh you know initiation you know it's a really you know it's an amazing amazing story in and of itself and so you know Hopefully we can, uh, you know, when the borders open up and we can start to kind of, you know, get some movement, then we can sort of, you know, hopefully start to, to look at building up, building the community. Oh, certainly. And also, when you come here, it would be good to record a podcast right in the medicine. That's very cool. We'll mm-hmm. drink the medicine and we'll record it right there. We'll sit by the river and we just talk. And we just talk from that place, you know. That's, mm-hmm. that's, a, like you, that's how you bring medicine to people. Talk from it. You're in it, you know. So I just want to, to add one thing, like uh, one sentence, maybe. Uh, like if you if you if you ask me what the medicine does, like if you boil down, you know, what the medicine, what what chuma does, I would say, and that's important for everybody, and especially for people who are practicing like yoga, meditation, all this, you know, different spiritual modality. What the medicine does, it just takes you from your head and puts you in your heart. That's what it does. This is the essence of it, you know. It just takes you out of concepts, the, the out of the world of concepts and words and puts you in direct experience. So you see what's in your heart and from this point you observe life. You look through it, you know. So what is there to be afraid? It's your heart. Don't you want to see what's mm-hmm. there? And even if it's something scary, maybe that's exactly where you have to go. In order to have a change in, in, in healing, so that's a problem with us Westerners. I'm Western just like you, so I went through this. So I understand Westerners, I understand the mentality. We're all locked in the head. It's our culture, you know. We are, you are overthinking things. Where for us life, it's a calculation for many of us, you know. So, and that's not the way, you know. The way is from the heart, and what you mean is a heart consciousness. Really, it opens your heart and you start feeling life not thinking about living you start living life and so that's what it does if you want to open your heart you want to feel period then this medicine for you well it's, it's, it sounds like a, a medicine for our times when when that seems to be a a, a real you know feeling that we're seeing it expressed yeah. daily so, advances takes us away from ourselves the whole culture you know digital it takes us from our organic nature from ourselves from nature so it's very important it's actually crucial to have this medicine now it's not a privilege anymore it's not like you know the whole thing the awakening is not a privilege anymore it's a necessity for many it's not a privilege for the few it's like we must wake up in order to have a future you know we are yeah. into oblivion it's time to wake up and come back to senses and recognize our humanness in ourselves and in other people and unite the world. That, and, that's that's yeah. a beautiful way to end that's a beautiful way to end the conversation, man. That's I couldn't I couldn't have put it any better myself. So really appreciate your time. Sure. Thank you. When, they, when the uh, when the when the when the borders open up and we can hopefully get out there and, and, and support your work. Um, and you know all the best. Big love. Thank you very much. And the b- new book is coming. Excellent. I look forward to it. All Take right. Care. Thank you, Joe. Bye bye. You awakened in that moment. That's that's how I see it. You know, it just awakes you to what it is. Yeah, I, th- I think I think your point's important about um, about trip reports because I think that. Um, you know, when, whenever I hear a trip report, particularly you know on some of this sort of DMT containing you know compounds, ayahuasca, for example, when you when you kind of hear the, the the you know the download of the trip report, it can really start to play on your on your kind of mind about you know what, what what's actually happening in the experience. So I mean, I, 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 I don't, I'm not sure how much you've worked with ayahuasca in the past, but I mean, my my own experience of ayahuasca was like like you say, you know, you kind of very much taken into into another place and you just have to kind of you know sit 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 <laughs> lie there and, and and kind of and go with it um 
and, you know, and I say I don't really like you know kind of doing doing trip reports, but as I say, my, my experience with Watuma was 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 very different, a lot more subtle, you know, done in the daytime, um, you know, much much kind of clearer in the head, much, you know, the, you know, there was a moment of I, I'm not going to lie, I was a little a little bit frightened, but I think that was again just an an ego an ego barrier perhaps that needed to be dissolved, um, you know, and working through the kind of en energetic systems of the body. Um, and just you know, and just working through that. So I, I mean, my my experience with Wachuma from a personal on a personal level was was utterly transformative. And I you know, and I only I've only worked with it you know a few times, but as I say, the the calling was very was very subtle, very strong. Um, you know, as, as it was described, you know, the grandfather of 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 healing plants. Um, is, is is there something you know? Can you elaborate that? Elaborate on that in terms of the kind of maybe the, 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 was calling Wachuma the grandfather, and uh, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I mean, although also over the years I I thought about this many times, and to be completely honest, completely honest to the core, I don't even know anymore if that's a grandfather. You know, to me it's kind of I feel so much feminine energy into it. You know, so much like motherly feminine. Maybe it's just my deep connection to nature does it. You know, mm -hmm. so it, it's hard to tell me that this is like. This is grandfather. This is like a male. To me, it's a very beautiful, motherly, feminine spirit with strong masculine um, aspect. You know, so I don't think he's wrong. There is that grandfather energy, but for me, it's more like just divine spirit. You know, just divine spirit of nature that medicine connects you to. You know, that's how I experience it right now. That's a very interesting point you make because, as I say, you know, in conversations with with um, you know people very close to me and my family um, who've who are maybe a little bit on the edge or hesitant about maybe you know make, making the, the the step into using you know working with plant medicines, um, watching some of your 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 work uh, and your videos around Wachuma and about that you know the beauty of the feminine energy, the beauty of nature and so forth has been almost a clincher. And, and getting them to think, actually, yes, I could do that. I can, I can see myself doing that. Yeah. Maybe the prospect of of the very intensive, you know, ayahuasca experience, which can involve very deep, you know, kind of visceral experience, um, can be a little bit off-putting to people. But I guess, um, you know, in terms of building a a kind of bridge between, you know, Main Street and and the mainstream, you know, kind of energy with with the kind of sacred energy of 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 the Andes. Which I'd like to talk about as well in terms of that whole, you know, Chavin connection and, and some of the artwork and so forth. I mean, that's that's a really interesting, uh, you know, topic from an anthropological point of view. But it seems to me that that you know, just on a, on the, and from a personal experience and, and the people I've spoken to and the experiences that I've had, that is what Chuma can be a very nice entry point into you know that, that the whole mystical realm, which is available. To you know, to everyone, it's available to everyone, and that was something that Don Howard used to say was, you know, I, I, I make this available for people who seek it. Um, you know, it's not mandate; it's not that everyone has to do it. It's just, you know, it's available for people who are who are coming to coming to seek it. So, um, I, I'm really I'm really interested in how and how that might might sort of play out. Um, you know, as as hopefully the borders will open up and. You know, hopefully, you know, when lockdown eases a little bit, we'll see what what kind of uh, experiences that we can have. I can have, you know, and and tell personally in my own family. Um, so well, I'm interested the in Chavin. Will extend it until the end of August again. So okay, so Chavin Chavin is an interesting kind of civilization. Is there is it is it worth maybe, maybe talking a little bit about Chavin? Um, and and what was interesting was it maybe it might be true, might not be true, but that apparently there's some artwork in Chavin which is you know kind of Amazonian in its uh, in its yeah, concept. That's, yeah, that's uh, you know I heard but Chavin I wasn't even familiar with. I heard it all from Howard, you know. So and I traveled with him there, and that's how I kind of got into it, you know. Then I have my own connection, my own understanding, but it was definitely based on everything I heard from him. So his theory was that Chavin was founded by Amazonian shamans. That was his theory. He thought that at some point they wanted to discover where the Amazon began. 
and they went you know against the flow and that's how they discover the, the place in Chevin because you go it, the, the river when you're in Chevin there are two rivers the temple is here and there are two rivers and this is where kind of Amazon begins kind of thing you know but it's not just that I mean it begins pretty much in the Andes it's everywhere every river that we have here goes to the Amazon eventually but that was the theory that they, it was the shamans from the Amazon discovered what you in the Andes and settled there and that was the uh the kind of the final uh, point of their journey you know so it's like the ayahuasca brought them to achuma and there's a big meaning into it you know it's deep actually it goes back to the ancient time and ayahuasca she is the gate many people come through ayahuasca to achuma it happens today too so it seems like it's the same thing that happened in ancient time if we take his theory as the truth, you know, if that's what it was, which which resonates. I mean, I have a few questions about this, but it resonates. It's not. It doesn't sound, you know, unreasonable. So, and today you can see the same thing. Many people, ninety percent of people who come to Peru, they they, they come to uh, uh, ayahuasca. They're not even familiar with Wachuma, and Wachuma is there. But it's waiting, you know. So ayahuasca opens you up to other plants and wachuma specifically, and they are partners, of course. So each play their own role. So it seems like the ancient cycle continues. People from Amazon discover wachuma, and you know they were ayahuasca givers, you know. And that's you know I can see how Harvard came to this because the art in the in the Chevin art you see uh, symbology from the Amazon that we don't have crocodiles in the Andes, we don't have serpents, mm -hmm. we don't have jaguars, we have pumas, but there it's a very strong element. So there are animals from the jungle mm -hmm. that are strongly right. presented in Chevinar. So that's how you know it makes sense. Although my question personally is how people who came from the jungle and life in the jungle is very different. You know, you you're, you build your huts from trees and, and and leaves and stuff. How those guys could build a Chevin temple, which is very elaborated with all these labyrinths and megaliths and all that. It's like it's like a very much like whoa. It's like another thing altogether. So that's like for me. That's a that's a question that I don't have an answer to. You mm -hmm. know, they came from Amazon, basically. You don't even have tools there. I mean, you don't even have any skills to build megaliths. How how you just come from a, you know, a, a hut into the megaliths? I mean, where is the transition here? That, that That's my question, you know? So, which brings me to another thought that the Chivin Temple was even earlier than archaeology willing to accept they they, they speak about chevin is like 3000 years culture so 3000 years old like a thousand years uh before christ but we don't really know what happened there before because they just uh, recently discovered another culture which uh, um, which is older the pyramids of Caral. did you visit Caral? no no it's it's like two hours from lima five thousand years old pyramids it's like same like in egypt so it's a serious complex of pyramids and it was discovered like in 90s it's a new thing and from uh, some research i was uh, looking at they found their you know um spines from huachuma cactus wow so that those guys were doing medicine too and they also think it was kind of a middle point between jungle and uh, andes so it's a trade point too so and that's 5,000 years old. So, you know, it goes bad, we were told mm -hmm. by the archaeologists. So, we don't know really what happened there, but definitely Amazonian symbology present in Chevin. And definitely there is a connection between them. And today the same thing happened. I mean, that's, that's a really interesting thing from my point of view, which is that just the intersection of so many different, you know, academic disciplines, so many areas of interest. So many sort of cultural phenomena that we, you know, we, we don't really understand that the plants would appear to be, you know, you know, op opening up for op opening up for all of us. Um, 
I just want to say to uh, Sergei Baranov, who's the um, owner uh, of the Huachuma Wasi Retreat Center in the Sacred Valley, Peru, uh, specializing in uh, work with Huachuma, which is an in indigenous uh, cactus species of the, of the Andes, uh, interchangeable name with uh, San Pedro uh, of, of the mescaline family. Um, on behalf of Thank You Plant Medicine, which is a, a grassroots global movement working to destigmatize the use of sacred plants and provide an information source uh, for people who are interested in uh, seeking further information. So uh, we're going to chat, you know, all things uh, Wachuma, San Pedro. Um, we're going to chat around, uh, you know, some of the, you know, local uh, sort of customs and practices, some cultural stuff. Uh, we'll talk about maybe go on to talk about you know prohibition and and you know it's going to be a freewheeling and interesting conversation um, around you know the the use of the sacred medicine wachuma. So hi Sergey. Hi John. Hi. John. hi. So um, just to sort of pick up on uh, maybe some you know some issues around you know prohibition uh, and and why sacred plants have been you know largely stigmatized and uh, and and you know their usage has been you know marginalized in our society so do you have any kind of opinion on on that any sort of you know the histor historical context around you know the the meeting of maybe the you know the west with you know indigenous communities in uh, in, in south america and how that's manifested in, in what we see today with this kind of you know blanket ban and, and war on drugs in the west well, from my own research, it goes back to to religious uh, aspect. It's when, well, Christianity took over the, well, Europe, when you had your own uh, indigenous practices. You had the Druids and the Celts, and you had Chinese in Peru, I mean, in Europe. But it was taken over by Christianity. Same thing happened in uh, Tibet. There was a bone religion that was shamanic tradition, and they were destroyed by Buddhists. And not many people knows that, but that's the history, you know. So you see this pattern all over the place, and especially in South America, we know what happened here when Spanish came here, you know in the beginning of 16th century so you know it's a, it's it's a the confrontation the way i see it it's uh, it has to do with uh, with the mind control basically you know you the indigenous people when these cultures they were practicing medicine they were taking plants i mean for them the notion that god is in a written word would be unacceptable they live with with that kind of energy they take the medicine they connect to the mountains nature nature is the god you know nature is the divinity of all nature uh, ancient cultures and medicine connects you to nature so imagine the situation when somebody comes and says no now you have to believe in our god and our god is written in the book you know there's a serious confrontation there you know it's like basically it's like we take your experience and we'll give you a concept instead so it had to be prohibited in order to impose religion on people that's what i see happen so we're talking about you know thousands of years of suppression you know today world i mean we can see the same patterns today but we just have more forces not just religion, but we have, you know, big farm. This guy, th these are big players. I mean, you know, these folks want to sell their drugs. So if you use plant medicine and you cure your depression, anxiety, you know, in a matter of a couple of weeks, I mean, that takes clients of the hook. So that's, you know, it's not very good business model for people who want to keep you hooked on medications. You know, yeah. And in terms of you know the, the dogma and the and the stigma attached to, to shamanism, do you, do you see uh, an opportunity now for you know perhaps you know shamanism to kind of reassert itself 
um, you know, in the world? Or, or, or do you think the, you know, the, the communications task, if you like, the, the task of, of kind of destigmatizing, um, you know, the use of plant medicines is, is kind of is beyond it? Do you, th- do you see, for example, it kind of being a bit like the 60s, 70s, where a lot of the really valuable research that got done was, was buried and pushed to one side? Um, you know, in the kind of you know, in the war on drugs, in the in this kind of stigma, where and this immediate perception that people have is that you know, using these medicines is a preserve of of hippies and people who is easy to marginalise. And to be clear, you know, I'm, I'm not you know, I'm no 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 you know uh, issue with hippies at all. I mean, that's not what we're saying. But the the mainstream perception is is that it's a hippie thing. It's like it's yeah. it's degenerate. How, so how do you see that playing out? Yeah, it, it's a false. Uh it's a false, it's misconception, you know, it's like, I, you know, I have friends who are hippies, but I'm not hippie, you know, but medicine has nothing to do with, with the lifestyle, you know, I think that has to change, and the more people will come and speak about it, and will show that they're normal people, normal citizens, you know, that will help to break through this steam. And in, and in your and in your work uh, at, at Wachuma Wasi up till now, I mean, what what kind of people have you had coming through, and 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 what kind of response have you had, and and in terms of you know maybe follow ups, people coming back and reporting on, you know, very profound changes in their lives, and I mean, what sort of response have you had in your work so far? Had all kinds of people, really, from all walks of lives, from all professions, and. Just yesterday we had the ceremony, I had psychologists, clinical psychologists here and who love the medicine and I had other academics here before and, you know, people who, who are searching for healing and people who are searching for answers. I was one of them actually. I never came to the medicine out of um, need to heal something. I was mentally, physically healthy. I was For me it was spiritual search really. I just wanted to understand myself, understand my relationship to the world and find meaning in life, you know? So, that's kind of people I see most, you know, people who are coming to find clarity, really. Yeah. And lots of professionals coming, too. And so, do, you, do, you, do you see sort of synergies with, um, you know, people who are maybe exploring, you know, yoga and, and meditation and, and sort of, you know, more kind of Eastern practices? Do you see a, a, a kind of synergy and a, a, a way that these practices can work together? Absolutely. And a lot of people that comes, they're coming from that background because I'm coming from that background. So I'm kind of attracting like-minded people. And definitely they, they find a very deep connection here especially people who practice different things and, you know, well read in Eastern philosophies, you know, they find, finally they are finding here what they were reading about, you know, and that's the whole point of this work. That's why it's important for people who really invested already in spirituality of any, any, any sort. That's why it's important for them to actually have the direct experience so they can see you know, and they can uh, analyze what they read, what they understood, and they can kind of review the whole thing through that light. You know, because I, mean, I guess I mean, you look, it doesn't. You don't need to be a, a kind of deep researcher to see that there's a rise in cases of, for example, you know, PTSD, addiction issues, all manner of kind of anxieties. You know, eating disorders, sleep disorders, autoimmune uh, diseases, which appear to be on the rise. Um, which are kind of linked to the, you know, kind of over, overall energy systems of the body and the, and the, you know, the interaction with the kind of, you know, the, the neuro, the neuroscience is, is is catching up with, I guess, what the ancient traditions have, all, have always known that there's there's, that there's, a, there's no division between, you know, mind and body. Body and mind, body and mind are totally linked. So I think, um, you know, it's it's a it's a really interesting, you know, one where people are, seem to be searching for meaning and, and tools. Uh, to you know to, to you know to, to I guess confront these these issues um, and so I guess what I see sometimes is that there's a kind of division between people who are into yoga or some people who are into meditation or some people you know people want to compare and, and, and almost compete mm-hmm. to see who's got the best option whereas it seems to be part of a, of a you know there's a, there's a range of tools that are available to the human um, and plants are a hugely important part of that so I guess the question is how do we integrate 
you know, those practices and, 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 you know, involve those, you know, the wider communities who are in search of the same sorts of healing? Well, I think it's up to the individual, you know. This is certainly there is a place for integration and for expansion, absolutely. I, I had yoga teachers here and meditators and, you know, all kinds of people and they found this experience very valuable. The report, the feedback is like, finally I understand what meditation means. <laughs> you know, finally I know what energy yeah. means. It's like, you, you can do Qigong all your life without actually feeling Qigong, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you when you drink Wachuma, you look at the tree and you understand that the tree was the first Qigong teacher. The first t Qigong master learned from nature. It's obvious. It's just there. You just see how it moves, you know? So you feel the energy. It's a feeling. So same with yoga, same with other practices. It's energy movement, and the more connected you are, the better your movements are, the deeper you're connected, and you expand, basically, what you're already doing. The medicine does not override what you're doing. It does not, like, uh, you know, maybe some people are afraid, like, oh, you know, I'm a yoga teacher or practitioner, and then I will go drink with chuma, and I will have to abandon my practice. Absolutely not. You will love more your practice. You will actually here you understand what yoga means doing it at the river on the medicine, you know, it's a different kind of approach. It will expand, it will deepen what you're already doing. That's what I see. And, and to, the, to those people who, who are maybe, you know, new to, new to plant medicine discussions or, or, or you know, not, not, haven't, haven't had that much information or exposure to it, what would you say, you know, how would you describe the experience? I mean, in, in term, you know, from sort of, sort of end to end, you know, from sort of preparation, actually, you know, doing the ceremony and then integration at the end. I mean, how would you, how would you kind of, you know, break it down for, you know, the, the, the completely inexperienced person? So, you know, to provide an access point to say, you know, this, this is something that is feasible. It's not something that you need to be, you know, completely worried about. It's safe, etc. How would you kind of break down the experience? Uh, well, I can just, uh, you know, tell you how we do it, you know, so mm -hmm. the whole process is uh, we always do ceremonies during the daylight. We start in the morning about 9, 30, 10, and we go until 6, and then at 6 we close the mesa and everybody's free. So how we do it, that's how, that's how it happens. We open up ceremony in Maloka, and ceremonial spot by the mesa, and after taking the medicine, we're just going out to nature. The whole idea of Wachuma is to connect to nature. It's, it's, a, it's a nature medicine. It's a nature connector. So we go out in different places. We have pure nature or sacred size, you know, man-made and different. And we stay the whole day contemplating beauty, basically. You know, I work with the daylight. I work with beauty. That's the medium of healing, medium for healing for me. So through that beauty come clarity and understanding and all that facilitates your healing. And I talk to people and it's very private. It's not a group experience, although there is group, but everybody have their own you know, space. I mean, we come to the river and everybody spread, you know, I know where, where you sit and know where everybody is. But, you know, no one is in your space, you know, it's important to have your own space for yourself and connect to the medicine in silence, you know and listen to the nature that's where, where it is and then we talk and then i come and i see who need a conversation and then we chat and during this conversation things come up and that's how we work and then we have a nice walk home and then we close the ceremony and then i make sure that everybody's back you know and relax and we close and people have their own evenings for themselves you know they cook together they talk they share they love and it's a happy it's a social time you know during the day, it's, you know, you observe, you observe the energy, so it's important to be quiet. But at night, it's a discharge, so it's a balance, you know. So, nothing is scary about it, it's, it's and also it's important to say that, you know, I make different medicines. I have strong medicine, I have light medicine, and it's for different people, different medicines. It's not like everybody come and have motor oil, you know. It's... Mm -hmm. It's, it's individual, that's why we're talking, and I'm seeing you, and I know what you need, and we're taking steps, and it's a gradual diving inside. So my job is to bring you where you have to be, not more, no less. You need to be exactly where you need to be, so you do your work. And for you, it might mean one cup, 
and for somebody else it might be half a cup and, and for somebody else it might be a stronger medicine you know so it's it's not the same for everyone but the state where you will be that's what what's important it doesn't matter how much you drink or what you drink so there is nothing to be afraid you are totally safe you you feel it i make people comfortable you know by conversation showing them talking i make it so you feel comfortable and relaxed from the start so we remove the fear we remove that it's like in in two hours after the medicine be taken you're already feeling yourself safe connected and you understand like wow there is nothing to be worried about it's beautiful you know that's where it starts when you have trust and confidence that's when you open your heart you're not afraid to open anymore and that's how the process begins and we build on that you know every ceremony is a build up towards the next and more things revealed yeah and one one of the ways that it seemed that you know the the count the counter kind of revolution against psychedelics in the 60s and 70s was able to kind of really take hold was that they, they frightened people to think that they were somehow going to go crazy and that they were never going to come back and it was going to completely yeah. kind of transform their you know psychological state forever so i mean yeah. just to kind of you know to run through how wachuma works and how that is just not ever going to be the case no it, it's simply impossible you know unless you do something seriously stupid you know and i'm not allowing that to happen the medicine itself is very safe wachuma is safe you know 99%, 99.9% of people connect, connect and find healing and find that to be very valuable, special, beautiful, mystical experience. There is one small portion of people who are not, but for my personal practice, I can say that, you know, I had over 11 years of running it. I had two crazy people here, like clinically insane, and there was no way for me to see it. I didn't see that. It was just something that slipped in, you know. Although I'm doing screening and everything, but it just happens, you know. They they flipped, but we're talking two people from hundreds, mm -hmm. hundreds and different ages and genders and professions and backgrounds. Like people connect in a very beautiful, similar way. Although the work itself is very personal. Yeah, I mean that, that, that's the thing about you know the, the the whole the whole process is is that you know there's a very important sort of pre-screening process where you know you have to evaluate people's psychological condition, their medical history, what kind of uh, you know other drugs they might be on, whether on different kinds of medications. Some things are going to be contraindicated, so it's not physically safe to do so. It's very important to kind of to stress that there's a very you know thorough screening process which takes place prior to the you know to, to the yeah. ceremony. Um, ceremony itself, I mean, my my experience, you know, is, is drinking essentially a cup of of cactus, you know, uh, you know, juice if you want, for want of a better term, um, and then. The, 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 the physical sensations like you say on on, on my tumor my own personal experience have, have been have been very very light I mean if there are if there have been blockages in my own energetic system they have found them and they they've worked with them I guess it's like having a massage if you're getting a massage and you you find a knot in your back and it takes a bit of time to to work it out um but you know little or you know no, no hangover no calm down um no, you know that. That's the that's the difference between drugs and medicine plants, you know. Mm. You know, drugs have that. I mean, you had the hangover and you feel sick and bad the next day. You know, different depends on the drug. But plant medicine is like you wake up tomorrow morning, you feel better than you felt yesterday. It's always better. It's always progressing into better health, better strength. You know, you wake up tomorrow morning, you feel great. You feel full of energy, clear headed, full of inspiration full, full of positive energy you want to do things you want to create you want to love you know yeah. you don't have no side effects yeah it's interesting you talk about um the you know using the whole plant as opposed to an extract and i guess that's very important because the kind of the chemical balances within the, the plant itself are, are the are the important part very important very important it's crucial to me personally it's absolutely crucial and i see a lot of misunderstanding around this and for example, let let's just let's just let's just talk about coca. I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. For example, okay, so we all know cocaine, right? Cocaine will fry your brain eventually. But why? 
Cocaine comes from coca leaves, okay? We have coca leaves growing here. So, coca leaves have 14 alkaloids. Cocaine is one of them. There is 14 alkaloids that all balance together. That, that you know, coca is a sacred plant here. It's like coca helps you to live. It suppresses appetite, gives you energy. People work in the mountains. Coca, it's, it's, it's absolutely, it's a supplement. People don't work without coca here. But, you cannot be addicted to coca. It's impossible. There is no way you can... It's just physically impossible. Well, why? Because it's a plant. It's a spiritual plant. It has balance. All the alcoholics together work together. And, and you take it in the right way. Now, cocaine is an extraction. So what happened in the 19th century? The guy came from Germany. They, you know, uh, identified cocaine as an active alcohol. Extracted that. And then, so you already killed the spirit right there. The, the spirit dead right there. So you just take one alkaloid from 14, so you left the whole thing out. Then you take that, then the whole process of uh, cocaine, it's very thing. So, so you kill the spirit, you use toxic, toxic elements to, to, to get that, and then, and then you cut it with more toxic things, and then you take it in a very unnatural way. Coca, we, we chew leaves, we make tea. Now, in order to ruin nose. What do you expect? Of course, it's not a good thing, you know? So, same thing with sugar. The sugar comes from the cane. You can eat as much sugar cane as you want. will not give you diabetes or, or, or cravings. It's just not happening. Mm -hmm. But when you do sugar, like, you know, extract the sugar, that's a, a horrible addiction. It's probably the, the worst addiction we can have. It's a sugar. So, you can see those examples changes the quality. Yeah, I, I see a parallel with uh, with tobacco, with um, mapacho, you know, used in, in ceremony that I, I've attended ceremonies and, and you know, in, in Peru, where mapacho, very powerful plant, very powerful energy, totally unrecognizable from the from the Western cigarette. You know, it's a completely... Yeah. You know, Completely, people smoke cigarettes every five minutes without even paying attention. It's like it's a totally habit. It's a habit, unconscious habit, you know. Mm. So it's just, it's just that, yeah. It's been the, the ritual, uh, the ritual about uh, around tobacco was lost. It's become just nicotine in, in inhaling. That's it. I need nicotine. Give me cigarette. You know, it's completely different from what we're doing here with mapachos. Yeah, so the 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 the, the parallel with um, mapacho um, and and cigarettes in the West, where you know it's a very powerful you know sacred plant uh, used in ceremony, um, you know it's a specialism as I understand it. There are some people who are specifically trained in the use of mapacho, um, whereas you know we, we smoke these cigarettes, they're very addictive, they're they're shot full of chemicals, could not be farther away from the you know from the sort of traditional usage. Mm -hmm. So it's really, a, a, I guess, you know, I, I, hear, I hear it said in plant medicine circles that, you know, that they, the, the, the plants are kind of reasserting themselves and that, they're, that you know, they're reaching out for, you know, to, to, to people in the West. So I'm interested in, in your perspective on, on how do you think it's best to, you know, to create that information source, that dialogue with with the kind of mainstream and in, and in, in, in Western societies, I mean, there are lots of articles now around, you know, evidence coming from university studies. You know, Imperial College in London, Johns Hopkins in the US, I think Maastricht, and no doubt there are you know many PhD thesis theses being written at the moment. But how do you think you know we can create a, a situation where we can start cutting through to you know Main Street to you know to people who might have had this kind of, you know, perception that, you know, plant medicines are not for them, they're for, you know, for hippies, or they're just too remote or too kind of obscure to get involved in. I mean, do you have any 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 view on that, how you think we can start to, to build that dialogue? I think it's by simply sharing experiences, you know. That's what it is, you just share your healing journey with people in different, using different outlets, you know articles, videos, talking in person, but it's, it's really about sharing. Because the, yeah. the, the university research is good, you know, it goes in parallel, but it's only one avenue. People sharing their experience, that's powerful. Feedback. What, what did you do to your life? 
how plant medicine changed your life. That's very powerful. And when you hear this from people like, whoa, you know, I can be that too. I can use that for myself too. Why not? It's open to everybody, you know? And then you start researching to it and you finally get into the experience itself because that's what, that's how you learn. Mm. And talking, I think dialogue is important. Bring people into it. Because it's just, there is a stigma. People are just afraid. It's like something scary, something um, something primitive too, you know? It's, it's like, and of course it's not. It's highly intelligent work. But the stigma, you know, says that it's primitive. And, and where, where you are in, in Peru, um, how, how, how prevalent is the usage in, in the actual Peru itself? Uh, is there a kind of a, a stigma within Peru or are people in Peru much more open? And, and how, does the, how do the authorities treat you know, the ancient shamanic practices? No, well, the medicine is legal here, so everybody knows about this. And um, there is no people not really fearing it. I don't see much stigma around that. People are aware of that and just like, okay, well, yeah, we, we have that. But not everybody doing medicines. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a small portion of population doing that, you know? So people like in the big cities, they're just as far from the medicine as people in the West, you know? It's, it's a modernity, you know? People in Lima... They would probably look at ayahuasca or other plants if they would know, probably in the same light. So it's not the whole Peru is just doing medicine. No, it's uh, you see it in the in, in the rainforest and in the mountains. That's where shamanic practices survived, and uh, well, the coastline too. You know, they have the Wachuma tradition there in the north. But these are the locations, you know. In those locations, medicine are accepted. Mm. But modern city, they are pretty much distant from that too. Although there is no fear about that. As, as I understand it, um, Wachuma is a, is, a, is a bountiful resource in the Andes. There's no, there's no issue with the, uh, the sustainability um, of, of Wachuma. Uh, no. But as more people come to the medicine, then it, it will become at some point because it takes years for the medicine to grow. So I always recommend people grow their own garden, you know, so you don't just take from the earth, you, you, you know, you, so it, the world has to be self-sustainable. You know, I have my garden for years and I use my own medicine. But if everybody start cutting cactus around, then there will be no cactus, you know. Mm -hmm. And we already see that happening with ayahuasca, you know. And my friends are telling me this already. That it takes now more to get the vine. You have to go deeper into the forest. It's not just in plenty there, you know. It's It, it takes more. So that means as demand grows, the plants will suffer in that sense. So it's important to have gardens. I, as I understand it, peyote is a is a, a, a threatened resource. Yeah, peyote is endangered. You know, it, it grows only in one place and, you know, the witch will go there every year. But as people become more aware of this and imagine what will happen, they will just, they will just deplete the supply. And this, and it's very important for indigenous people of Mexico is their, is their way of life. I mean, they need the medicine to sustain their spirituality to sustain their life that's how they went through the oppression mm. that's how they survived all this uh, inquisition that was there so it's very important to protect the medicine so uh, so i guess there's there has to be a, a you know the different different areas where we focus on so the government you know the government environmental kind of departments have to somehow create a kind of cultivation kind of program or is it more? Do you think it should be more about individuals who are who are cultivating, or we should we should restrict the tourism, or, or what? What would you say would well, be the? I think it's it's usually better when government stays away from things. You know, it's not their business. They need to make sure we have our roads here and bridges intact, and that's their role. When it comes to medicine, I think it's it's up to the person. You know, it's just to raise this this awareness in people and. 
explain that you know it's not in abundance i mean you need to grow your own garden you need to protect what we have mm-hmm. and cultivate your own medicine it's important that's really personal yeah, yeah. I, t- I mean, I'd heard you know anecdotes around ayahuasca, also iboga, the you know the the African uh, psychedelic as as evil game treatment centers spring up, and and you know because of the the effectiveness of its ability to treat addiction, um, you know, a, quite lucrative businesses have set up around you know evil game treatments. So I'd heard you know anecdotal kind of discussions around you know issues with with the kind of extraction of the of the plant from gabon um so there's a definitely a a sustainability kind of discussion to be had and i think you know from what from the more more and more people that i speak to it would appear that that, you know the it's about you know the right to grow um you know uh, and people are looking with beg your pardon the legal right you mean yeah i mean that people are looking with some trepidation at the you know the cannabis legalization programs where you know you don't have the right to grow your own you have to go through yeah. you know dispensaries and 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 you know of course they want to control that yeah so there are some there's some very very big questions around you know plant, plant medicine and that, and that i guess that's one of the interesting kind of areas because there's something for everyone there's something for the politician there's something for the environmentalist there's something for the you know the, the hardcore academic scientist there's something for the spiritual person uh, and kind of everything in between it touches in so many areas mm-hmm. um right now and particularly it would, would appear to have at least a partial answer to some of the you know the, the difficulties that we're experiencing particularly with the with the pandemic and so on um you know, and the rise of anxiety and, and you know, men, mental kind of, you know, anxious anxiety, which is pre- really, really kind of prevalent right now. So, yeah, just in, in the realms of, you know, of, of personal experience, um, you know, I read, interestingly, uh, you know, one of the stories in your book was was around the uh, the experience with, with the scorpions. Well, is, that, is that something you want to maybe kind of you know for a bit of bit of light relief? <laughs> well, yeah, we can talk about that. Sure. Yeah. So you want to tell the whole story? I, I'm really. It's an amazing story. I think it's a really interesting one. To... Well, that that was my shamanic initiation, you know, which at the time I didn't see it that way. You know, I just realized it later. But at that time. Things were different, you know, it just was one of those times I went to see my friends in Mexico to take medicine with them. And uh, and it was a full moon ceremony and it was just, the whole thing was strange, you know, from the beginning. It was just like, the whole thing like was a setup, but not a setup by the people. You can't set it up, but it, it's just set up by the spirit somehow, you know. But it felt strange, it felt weird. I, I even thought to leave. When I came... It felt strange, and I feel like tension in there, and people were like a bit tense, and I feel like I don't know, maybe I just go home, you know, back to California. But I'm just not doing these things like this. It's not my style. If I do something, I go all the way, you know. So I said, okay, I'm here. We'll just do it, you know. And then the the shaman I was with, I mean, he told me, okay, you have to build a shoe like. Um, mound from mud, like a half moon around the fire fa- uh, facing east, I think it was and and he said like, you know make sure you do it the best you can because your future will depend on that so like, what? I mean, like, my future will depend on the way how I will build a you know, little c- half circle around the fire like, what's that about, you know but I, I took it seriously, you know so I really build it the, the best I could, and then we started the ceremony around eight. He put, the, you know, his prayers, and we started drinking the medicine. And, and around midnight, I was a fireman, so the fireman, you know, according to uh, well, he's coming from the Native American tradition too. So the fireman take, uh, you know, drink the water first, and the midnight, and then share with other participants and give it to to the fire to the earth. So I, I, did, I did just that, you know, and then after 
it was exactly midnight and the moon was just right there and then I just uh, took my you know fire stick and just you know moved the firewoods in, in the fire and my last words were peyote is real peyote is real and as I said that uh, moments after I got stung I felt like two stings you know in my thighs and jump like whoa what was that I mean is that part of ceremony <laughs> that, that, that didn't feel natural to me at all. I was like, whoa, I, I just was stunned, you know, this is real stuff happening. So I jumped and like, whoa, what's happening? Trying to see what's there. So he knew right away what happened because they live there. I mean, they know what's happening there. But he didn't tell me right away. He said, hey, just try to relax. And I'm like, relax? I mean, I was just stunned by something here and that doesn't feel very good, you know, because I feel venom already in my you start feeling the, like fire in your legs and your thighs, like a, a, an inch below my genitals, you know, on both thighs. And you you start feeling the circle, it's circulating, or it's first like a burning, and then start like circulating, and then like, and then start, and then after, pretty quick, and then it's just coming up your body, like to your heart or your throat, and then you feel like, whoa, this is no, you know, no joke anymore, you know? So he said like, well, there's nothing I can do, you have to go through it. You know, that's it. And he so just kept off life. And he said, like, there's nothing I can do. But he didn't say that I was bitten by the deadly scorpions. <laughs> if he would say that, I, I would panic to death myself. I would probably kill myself there. I know what happened, you know. It would, I, would, I would get panicked. I was already panicking, but still, like, whoa, not knowing what was exactly bit me, you know. And then after 20 minutes, I got very sick, like to the point when it's like, whoa, let's say you're just like, you're losing it, you know, you're losing your sight, you're losing everything. So you just lay down, I lay down like in agony, the agony start, you know. So the good thing is that, that this night I, I drank the most beauty ever. So it was a lot in me, a lot of medicine in me. So that's what helped me through this three days of hell. It was three days, three nights of hell, you know. Literally, I lost my body. I was just like, my self-awareness, my consciousness, laying down on the ground without body anymore. So, okay, so I know how it feels with, with not having body, you know. <laughs> and your body is like, you don't have it, but at the same time you're connected to it and it's in agony. So it's burning, it's freezing, it's itching, it's like everything. And you can do nothing, you can open your eyes. You lose so this uh, this venom it's uh, it, uh, it it shuts it shuts down your nervous system completely, including your lungs. That's how you die, because you can't breathe anymore. That's why you see stuff coming out of your mouth. You know? So what the medicine did it just allowed this minor minor very little oxygen just to just enough to breathe through my nose so I can survive. It's enough so my brain will not shut down, you know, and my heart will not stop beating, but very little. So it kept it moving. Also, it blocked my liver from getting poisoned too. So it did what it has to do in order to let me live through it. But it was not just the medicine kept me alive. It was my will to, to live. So it was real fight. It was like fight for my life, you know, with the help of the medicine for sure. Without it, you can't breathe, you're dead. You know, I would be, with the dose I had, 20 minutes maximum, you know, and then you die. Because these, these guys are deadly there, you know. Mm. And, they, and they know that they, they're losing kids every year to this. It, it's a serious problem, the scorpions there. It's like, they, it's, it's, it's normal. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's like, scorpions were there probably before people, so, mm. you know. And it was three days of literal hell trying to make through this. And I went through my death. And then after this, I went through my old age, you know, and I, finally on the fourth day, I felt like I made through it on the fourth day. When I flew back home in California to California, I still felt electricity in my hands from elbows to my fingers, like fourth day. But I was already seeing, talking. I was normal, you know. Mm. So it was very unusual 
experience, you know, like uh, meeting your death literally there. She was like sitting there, you know, like she was sitting there and I had a choice to go or not to go, but it was easier to go than not to go. It was mm. easier to give up and die, you know, but I, I said like, no way, man, I'm not dying now. I mean, I just found my path. I just found my way in this life, you know, it's like just met. It was like, what, in 2005, I, I came to Peru and then three years of medicine. So I am still was like, you know, going through it and learning and really discovering. And with Peyote, I worked like, that was like one year, 2008. So, and, and I was like 32 years old. So it's like, that's it. It's all, it's all over for me. I mean, what a pity. I'm just starting to leave, you know. So that's what happened in Mexico. And important things change after that, really, you know. It's like my fear of death evaporated. I always had fear of death, like as a child. Mm. So that's gone. And and my preoccupation with afterlife, that's gone too, you know, just to mention a few things. Like it, it's no longer important for me what's after, you know. Everything, like what I, what I took out from this experience is like for me personally, what's important, it's everything here. It's important how we live our life. It's important how we live every moment until we die. That's what's important, you know, the focus came back to life. Not afterlife, no new incarnation, no life in another planet. That's all gone, you know. It's like becoming human, become, what does it mean to be human? And what does it mean to be alive, you know? So the medicine brought me back to Earth. I mean, yeah. real life, you know. That's, that's an interesting, very interesting point, actually, because I think a lot of the time, you know, and, and I'm very, very conscious not to make, you know, not to make judgments um, about, you know, other people's, you know, personal experiences with plant medicines and so on. But I often feel that some, something gets lost in the kind of, you know, we're in this dimension, you know, this is where we live. This is where we've got to spend a lot of time. So the, you know, the if some people perhaps maybe have a desire to escape this one, to go somewhere else, find something better that seems to me to be a i don't know i mean that that's that's from my personal point of view you know maybe not the kind of best use of plant medicine i mean i guess the the, the best use of plant medicine from my side is to make this this experience the best it can possibly be yeah escapism it's it, it's certainly a part of this kind of uh, engagement with plants and psychedelics for some people you know mm. and i think it was for me too in my youth, in my 20s, I was just bored with my routine, bored with life, you know. Just, I found But are you there? Yeah, I'm still up. It's cut out just, just oh, you're bored okay. with life, cut out just then. So, escaping yourself, yeah, I understand, but it's a misuse of plans. The whole point is engaging yourself. It's engaging with your life and figuring life out for yourself. That's how I see. It. That's what I'm trying to do with people who come here. You know, I want them to be engaged with their life. I want to help them to embrace their life and understand what has to change in their life, what has to heal in order to be happy, in order to find their own happiness, their own path. So for me, it's that. And I think it's actually rooted in that, in that near-death experience in Mexico with peyote. Mm -hmm. I think it's coming from there. Because before that, I was like all in the sky too, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know? In, in your protocols, uh, Wachumawasi, uh, how many ceremonies would you typically do um, over over a period of time? Is it a week you spend, or is it is it kind of open-ended, or how do you how do you run your your retreat? It's completely open. I have people coming for weeks and for months and as much time you want to spend here, you're welcome, you know. We do ceremony every two, every two days, all year round, so they rest, they drink. And people come in their time, so people come for a month, okay, so whenever you come, you join for the next ceremony or for a week, whatever. So it's open because from, from, from my experience, there is no way, absolutely impossible to tell how much medicine you need to take how much ceremonies you need. It's just not possible. It's, it's individual. It's personal. Some person come for a week and like, whoa, 
that's enough now for a couple of years to digest. Other person comes and says, yeah, I need to go deeper. I want to go deeper. I need a couple of months. So it's not like, okay, come in two weeks, you achieve this. There is no way to say that. Mm -hmm. It's like, I recommend a couple of weeks, like two weeks. I recommend that because it takes time to settle. I mean, first of all, we live in the mountains, like 3,000 meters. It's 10,000 feet altitude. So you come here, it's a different environment. So the air is thinner and you're kind of already floating here just by being here, you know. So it takes it takes a week to settle into the medicine, into the process and feel it and sleep over, you know, and talk and, you know, and then it's just too early to, to leave because we're just starting. So it's really beneficial to, to give yourself a couple of weeks at least, you know. But of course, if you have the time and resources, spend a month, six weeks, that's that, it's just a deeper work. The more time you spend with the medicine, the deeper you go. And, and it's never over too. It's not like you spend six weeks and it's all over and you... Done. It's like at now it's over. For now, that's what you took. That's what you, that's what the medicine gave you. What you needed, you go home and you practice and you apply it in a couple of years and then you come back maybe you know. So I, I kept it open, open, completely open. Come, mm -hmm. stay as long as you want, as long as you feel it's good for you, as long as you feel you can take, and you can rest too. I mean, you can just work a couple of weeks and say, you know, I just want to rest for a week, you know. That's fine too. And in, in terms of you know, is there is there a, a kind of age sort of starting point or an, you know, I guess it, you know, is it, I guess people are worried about maybe younger people experiencing plant medicines because of you know, you know, emerging neuro neurological capabilities and whatnot. Is there a kind of a an age starting point that you would say you know don't don't do it until you're 25 or 30 or you say start 18 or what, what would you you know i think it's the same way it's individual some people are mature in 25 and others are stupid at 50 so it, it's not like you know I, I work with 18 because it's just a legal age so if you want to bring your kids and they're 18 Okay, we can work. Of course, it will be a different work. It will be very light, very mild. But I, I can tell you this. If I would have access to this medicine when I was 18, man, I would save a lot of trouble to me, to my parents. And mm -hmm. I didn't have medicine. I had drugs, street drugs. And I didn't have any guidance too. So yeah. medicine can help. Can help, especially when you're 18, like 18 to... I mean, this is when you're really opening up and starting to kind of, you know, looking for your way in life. So imagine if you get this guidance, this guidance, and it will set you straight, and it will, it, it, through it you understand, like, ooh, alcohol, drugs, no, I don't need that. I mean, I need, you know, you can save years of trouble. Yeah, I, I mean, I just just the other day, um, I saw something on on a on a social media platform where. There's a challenge to take high doses of hay fever medication. Hay right? fever, what's that? Hay fever. You know, hay fever when you're allergic to uh, to, to grass and pollen. Oh, okay. And you sneeze and all that. Yeah. So yeah, there's yeah. a there's an over the counter um, hay fever medication, and what what young kids are doing right now is they're, they're challenging people to 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 take lots of this stuff because it gives them a Hi, I can have a kind of a high it's absurd um and you know young young 18 year old young people younger even buying you know tremendous amounts of alcohol you know synthetic synthetics you know they don't they don't know what they are you know so there's a there's a there's a kind of safety element i mean in terms of you know harm reduction and safety i think it would appear to me from my own experience of working with it and from what you're saying is that wachuma is is up there with one of the very safest experience you can have. Yeah, it's a very safe medicine, you know. You have to be very respectful, you have to know what you're doing too, you know. It's a very powerful medicine, but it's safe. It's mm -hmm. It has zero toxicity. I mean, you just can, you know. The worst can happen to you is like that you just melt with the universe and, you know, and then you come back hopefully a better person, you know. <laughs> but, that is scary in that sense, of course, can be devastating for ego, but it's still safe, you know, you know, all things considered, comparing to other plants. Yeah. And 
And how, how do people how do people get to you? I mean, they, you, I guess you fly to to Lima and then you get an interconnecting Cusco. flight. How how would they arrive? Yeah, they arrive in Cusco and then we meet them in Cusco. I send my driver, okay. pick you up in the airport, bring you here, so you're totally safe. You everything's taken care of. You come here, you feel home. You know, I mean, you live with us. You live in our home. The our retreat center, it's our home. So you meet my family, play with my kids. You know, it's like we make it very very homey feeling you know so you you relax and you don't feel like you're far away from home the idea is to to remove all the barrier as possible so you just focus on the medicine work you know mm -hmm. you connect with your family back home good internet connection so it's important to be connected and there's some you know and then you know with the, the growth of you know ayahuasca tourism there are some sometimes some concerning reports about you know safety for for women traveling and so on so you know just i guess just you know how do you you know i guess you, you live with your wife and your kids so it's a very different um you know situation so it's um you know just to sort of you know if i'm if i'm going to say to my mother for example you know you know, to go and experience this medicine a woman traveling on her own um you know sa safety is is is, is obviously paramount um, yeah, especially when it comes to ayahuasca, mm. because because of the nature of the plant and the nature of the way it does, uh, the way it happens. It's like you drink ayahuasca at night, and and you know you you're not there completely. I mean, ayahuasca takes you, so you can be easily abused, and there is no way for you to escape. Mm. And it happens in Peru and I hear that and I, I know personally people who came to me you know telling me this that that will happen to them in the jungle so unfortunately you know when you go to the jungle I mean don't, don't expect Buddhist monks there I mean these are jungle people I mean not all of them are that but you know morality it's not a part of this environment you know so there are good people there are good curanderos for sure but there are people who, are, who can easily abuse you and that can be serious trauma for life yeah. We hear that it happens. So if you want to send your mother, send to people you know, people with good reputation and people you personally know. When they will be safe. Otherwise, just wandering around the jungle is not safe. And uh, sexual mm -hmm. uh, abuse happens. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a sad thing, and that, and that's part of the you know the the aim behind you know some of the work we're doing you know within the Thank You Plant Medicine community is to try and establish a you know the you know a cohort of safe of, of safe a safe network yeah of, of, it's, very of important it's very important because it's important of course you know to keep people safe and also uh when something like that happen it gives medicine bad name you know and that's it's just wrong it's just unfair to other people who practice in a good faith you know so if something happened because for media, it's like, oh, somebody died from ayahuasca in the jungle. Okay, ban ayahuasca. I mean, wait a second. The guy came all drugged up on antidepressants. Of course, you can do this. I mean, you will die because there is a contraindication, you know. So it's not like ayahuasca bad or it's like you were not prepared. You came with the wrong, you know, in the wrong way. So it's very important to, to separate that. And yeah. keep the keep the medicine keep keep the good name for for the medicine and people who practice it in a good faith. So I mean, give pa pandemic considerations aside, um, what what's next for you? Um, you know, in terms of your output, in terms of the work you're doing, what's your kind of you know short term plan? Plan, yeah. Well, you know, we're living now in a world where uncertainty seems to be the only certain thing. So it's very hard to plan ahead. So I'm planning to establish more online presence and possibly doing podcasts, videos, write books. I mean, I can do ceremonies using Skype. I mean, you know, like <laughs> yoga. You can do you can do yoga using Skype, no problem. But with the medicine, you need I need your participation. So. Until that change, I think uh, that's what I'm going to do. And I have uh, some Peruvians coming drink with me. So, but of course, it's a very small percentage. Uh -huh. Most of my uh, guests are, you know, um, foreigners, people uh -huh. from states, Canada, Europe, Australia, you know, English-speaking world. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. So for now, I mean, we, we can control the world, we can control the border, we just can control our, the way we spend our energy, the way we spend our time. So I'm trying to be creative and create content, you know, maybe write more books, make more films mm -hmm. and talk to people. So where, where can people find your, you know, your output? What's the, I mean, we'll put it all in the, in the show notes, but what, what's the kind of the, the best place to find your... I think my website has everything in it, uh, watchumawasi.com. Mm -hmm. Everything in, and my books, my films, and people just write and we talk, you know. Some people, we talk for months before they come. It's not like you call them today and tomorrow you're here. Some people talk to me today and come next year. It takes time for people to plan. You know, it's a serious it's time of job, it's, it's money, it's, it's many things that you have to put together, you know, especially if it's a family event. It takes more, so it can be a year of preparation. So I'm willing to talk to people always, and I have my screening process, and people fill out the form. So in the form, when you tell me, when you fill out the form, I, 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 I have a pretty good idea of who you are, what you're looking for, and what can, what can I do for you. And that's why it's important. And then if I feel like it's important to talk to a person, then we have a Skype call, you know, just to get more personal, just to feel the person, mm -hmm. you know, the face. Yeah. Look at the eyes. And just just to kind of you know we're kind of we've we've chatted for well over an hour now. So just to maybe wrap up, is there any sort of any one story or any any sort of case study? Obviously, and and anonymous, of course, respecting privacy. But is there any you know real story of transformation that you've seen that you know someone's come with you know real issues and they've and they've seen them transform? Um, you know, just, you know, maybe there's so many you can't remember, but, you know, it's not, it's not. Well, it's a lot of people here who've been yeah. healed and transformed. And to pick some, it, it, it's, it's hard to pick some. It, it, I had people coming with severe depression, suicidals, like heavy duty, you know, and... Okay, I know who to pick. Yeah, that, that would be... That would be a good one. So that that was a girl from UK. She came and she was heavily depressed for many years, like chronic. It's like nothing. She was uh, she did everything she could to help her. You know, it's like nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing gave her meaning in this life. So she decided to kill herself. And uh, so she came. I didn't know about this. Um, she just said that, you know, I'm struggling with depression and I'm hoping that plant medicine can help. So, okay, sure, that, that happens, come. And then here already she sh shared with me more. So I was pretty shocked to hear that because she was like a very intelligent woman in her 40s, very, you know, but she completely lost touch with life, completely life, lost meaning in life, completely. So she said, you know, that's it, uh, I'm, uh, she had her date of death, she decided on when, and she told me that there was a program in Switzerland, she found, it's called assisted suicide, you pay 8,000 euros to take some, uh, what was it, uh, I forgot the name of that, it's a poison you take and you die, that's it, for 8,000 euros, so she already had a date, to do that, it's like scheduled to die. I mean, it's like, whoa, I never heard that happen to me before, you know, I had people depressed, but like, this is already like, you already planned your exit, you know? So I said, whoa, you know, give, give it a chance, give it a chance, give medicine a chance, you know? So she came, she gave it a chance, and she spent with us a couple of weeks, and her transformation was incredible. It just was to, to just to see her change every ceremony. The smile comes back, the light in the eyes, and she was like, "Whoa! I mean, I, I didn't see all this beauty in life. I mean, it's like I, I don't have that beauty in my life, you know." So this beauty was melting her, melting her, kind of resurrecting her, and bring her back to life. And we had many conversations and. She left and she canceled her death. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not, not funny, funny, but it's... But, it's but um... it, it is in the same way. I mean, it's like, mm. what? I mean, it's like, 
You know? Yeah. Like she was, she already paid to die. So it's like, wow. I mean, so basically, the medicine just saved her life here. And she's not the only one. I had more people. Yeah. But other people just were not scheduled yet. They were like, they were like, they, they give me the chance, you know? I had another, another guy here who came. He was a PhD in psychology. The guy became a PhD in psychology just to heal himself. Nothing helped him. He did all kinds of everything you can imagine. Like everything. He said, he, he listed things I never heard about. It's like, whoa, what kind of therapy is that? You know? It's like, what? I was like, that's a, there's a lot of therapists people offering there, you know? Mm -hmm. And not help. So he said, like, you know, you are my nuclear option. I said, okay, you know. So he spent, in his cases, he spent like three months with us. The guy is still kicking. So healing is certainly important and vital. It, it save lives. It can save lives. Yeah. But it's not the only dimension. And it's important. It's, it's, it opens up the whole new way of living. And as, uh, you know, before we talk about spiritual folks who are coming, you know, yoga, meditation, Eastern traditions, for them, it's not about healing, it's about awakening, it's about, you know, enlightenment that you hear about, you know, it's like, what is enlightenment, uh, what is awakening, and you can ask this question all your life, and you can follow a guru for for 30 years, but you will never actually experience that, to, to, to understand. It's, it's good, but it takes you so far. Same in therapy. And actually, this conversation I had yesterday with a psychologist who told me that in the medicine. He said, like, yeah, I understand now. Words can take you so far. And this medicine is incredible. And I want to bring you my patients. So it's wonderful. Come with them. It's, it's, together, it's wonderful. Psychology, open mind psychology, open mind spirituality and medicine. It's powerful combination. You can understand a lot of things. You can heal a lot of things, you know. So... For spiritual, for people who are practicing, they can find the whole new dimension here. While practicing, what they're doing. It's mm -hmm. not replacement. You're not going to lose anything. That's important to say. On shamanic path, on plant medicine path, you cannot lose anything real. All you lose is just false. You only falsehood you lose. But why would you afraid to lose that anyway? Why, why do you need to carry that baggage? You want to be real, don't you? That's the whole point of this medicine, to be real. So anything real, you will not lose. You love your family, you will love them more. You love your work, you will love it more. You love your practice, you will love it more. It's like, this is a real thing. Your heart will expand, not diminish. Your practice will deepen, not, you know, cancel. Yeah, I mean, that that was that was certainly my my own experience, um, you know, with my own family, with my own my own sort of you know my role as a father, um, my, the you know, the love that I have for my children, you know, my, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with myself, physical yeah. physical healing, um, you know, it kind of it, 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 it sort of very fundamental. The joint my joints got better, you know. There's so many so many sort of hidden benefits to to that oh, to, to, to the practice that people don't really understand even i mean and, and i guess they're, they're barely understood at the at this kind of scientific level because they, they was you know the research isn't there like why, why was my hip my hip for example was healed in a in a plant medicine ceremony you know you wouldn't think that would happen but that that that's how that's how it went down so i think that's the, i think that's a great way to leave it in terms of the, that really uplifting message of like you know look that you know these are totally transformative experiences oh, yeah. um open very open and accessible to everyone safe uh, and and you know yeah. and we have you know outstanding practitioners who are delivering a you know a fantastic service to you know to humanity in, in places like Wachumawasi. so i think you know thank you for the for the uh, for the work you've done and you know the the road that you've travelled to you know to get where you have so I think you know for people listening or watching you know watch your Wawasi and you know we'll look out for your new book coming out um, and I'm sure like the other two it's going to be you know I, I read them both in one sitting you know just didn't put them down so you know that was a uh, you know I'll look forward to the next one. <laughs>